talk to, to us about the events of August 2017 in Charlottesville. Tell us and remind us um, about what led up to it and what you experienced um, over those two days. And I'll, I'll start right here with you, John. Uh, so I think what a lot of people forget uh, is that Charlottesville was preceded, the events of the United Right Rally in August were preceded by a KKK rally uh, in downtown Charlottesville in July of the same summer. Uh, and so there was a lot of preparation, uh, at least in the clergy community, uh, you know, knowing that, that there was a potential that people could come to town, although there were really maybe, maybe 50 KKK members there. I wasn't, I was in Israel at the time. Um, but I came back and when I went to Charlottesville, this is sort of what we expected. Um, so I arrived to town on Thursday, uh, and on Friday morning I attended a, a sort of non-violent uh, direct action training, uh, just in case we, my sister and uh, my brother-in-law and I were not sure uh, exactly what type of protest we were going to be participating in the next day. Uh, there were a lot of variables at that point, it still wasn't clear how large things could be. Um, but, I mean, the air was tense. You know, I got to the airport on Thursday evening, and my sister at the time was living on the downtown mall. Uh, and, you know, just walking around, there was already, you, know, you could see some kind of barriers not really being put into place for use, as we saw later. They really didn't do anything. Um, but, you know, there was, it was fraught. Um, and then on Friday, we went to this training, uh, and that in itself was, was very challenging. Uh, many different types of people coming together, uh, you know, all opposing white nationalism, but some with conflicting viewpoints to each other. Uh, but, you know, set that aside in moments of extreme crisis. Um, I continue with the, just the events of the weekend. Okay. Uh, so, so Friday evening, the synagogue, uh, as you do when your sister is the rabbi. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and of course, no, it was a wonderful service. It was really small. The whole community kind of came together, almost bracing for what was going to happen. Uh, and after that, we went uh, down the street, not really down the street, I guess I, my map of Charlottesville isn't so great. Uh, you know, Oswald, no, much better than I, but we went to a much larger church uh, and had a massive interface. So there really were people three blocks away. Three blocks away. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, and, and so we, we went to this really wonderful church. Uh, are you sure the same one? Right across from UVA? Oh, you that church. That church. Oh, that church. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. A mile, a mile away. By the way, thank you. Um, and so we went there for this interfaith service, and everything was pretty uplifting. And there were my sister was doing music with different, you know, clergy <coughs> leaders from various denominations of various different faiths, uh, and it was it was pretty inspiring until we went to leave, uh, and they said, "You can't." Why not? Uh, and there is a actually a, a column of torch bearing, tiki torch bearing white nationalists walking past the church right now. So not only can you not leave, but you need to get away from the windows and congregate in here uh, and, and be as, you know, let's be as vigilant as we can and make sure everyone gets out of here safely. Uh, and that, to me, was the eye-opening moment, I think, that showed me just what type of a situation, that this may actually be dangerous. You know, I grew up on stories of the Holocaust uh, and have taught them myself uh, and learning about a group of Jews ref taking refuge in a church, church while well, nationalists are outside with torches, uh, is, is pretty triggering. Uh, it's just to put it mildly. Uh, but we were fortunate they managed to go past. They weren't chanting that Jews will not replace us, so that wasn't the best. But you know, we we moved on and we went back to my sister's apartment. We got out safely. We took someone else home to needed a ride, uh, and we you know, pulled up a periscope age of mass media, but really it's unlimited media. Uh, so there were people broadcasting this rally uh, at, at you know, UVA by the statue of Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and we watched this and heard the chants on the internet, and we started to think, okay, tomorrow might be kind of a rough day. Uh, and so we got we got up in the morning, we did our interfaith march, and then my sister and I set up camp in the Methodist church that was three blocks away from the synagogue, across from the park in question, uh, with the statue. Uh, it's now Independence Park. I believe. No, not it's, it's changed names twice since then. Um, since the initial city council effort to move the statue, it went from, it went from Lee Park to Emancipation Park, and now it's called Market Street Park. <laughs> so 
they, they're in this church across uh, three blocks away, right? Or a mile away. A mile away. Right across from UVA. Right across from UVA. You're a journalist. You are probably beginning to track this weeks before it happened. At what point do you get a sense that this is something more serious than the, or, than the ordinary Klan rally? And what's your experience of what you are seeing on this piece of life? Honestly, I, I wasn't sure that it was going to be more serious than the Klan rally, although I was shocked at the language. Not the body language, but just saying Jews will not replace us. I remember like, clearing my ears and thinking that it was a, I thought at first that they were morphing, you will not replace us, and that it was just uh, a small subset of groups saying Jew will not replace us, and I was like, oh, those guys are going to, they're out of line. So I was recording it with my little pocket audio recorder, and I listened the next day, and they were very emphatically saying Jews will not replace us, and I was, I was really shook up by that, and I, and I, and I walked over to this guy who who I didn't, I had never heard of him at the time. You're giving me more credit for prior research than I deserve. I, I was completely unaware of who these people were, and, and, I, and I still have the tapes of me coming up from the sky, and I said, no, what are you guys doing here, and who are you? And he told me he wrote for the Daily Stormer, which is, 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 a, is, a, is a modern day neo-Nazi uh, online publication which takes its name from the Der Stürmer. And so these people, one of the things I also discovered this moment is that they, they are, and some of them at least, are engaged in this practice called trolling, where they will say the most outrageous things. You don't have in your mind, and have a, the Jewish audience here doesn't have to have their mind go very far to think what kinds of outrageous things they would say. And then if the person hearing it says, did you just say that? You know, basically like relishing the Holocaust, they're like, you know, what's your problem? Like, they, they, get to, they get to either pass it off as a joke or hope that you, use the word triggering a minute ago, Jeffrey, people could legitimately be triggered by hearing talk like that. And then you might overreact, and then they get to fold their arms and say, What's your problem? So, they get to have it both ways. Or more ways than one. So, I want to talk... I, I guess I have to use my mic. mic. I want to talk a little bit about this... Um, you will not replace us. So, you weren't alone, right? So, the, the night of the Tiki Torch rally. Um, CNN reports um, that... These white nationalists and alt right are chanting, "You will not replace us." Now, um, my hair is not great from a lot of rock shows, um, but it was fairly clear that it would, they were chanting, "Jews will not replace us." But CNN was not alone, right? I asked friends what they had heard. They also reported back. You will not replace us. That is, it seems to be in across media, but also the American public, that they were hearing the same thing, even though that wasn't what was being chanted. Both were being chanted. Both were being chanted. So it would be great to hear a little bit more about what was the breakdown in the group, who was chanting what, and what was the reaction. So it was a column of, let's say, three, four hundred males mostly. There were, I, I didn't, again, I didn't know what I was coming upon, so I'm taking pictures, I'm record, recording audio, I'm like, what is this? You know? And maybe out of those 400 people who had tiki torches on the University of Virginia lawn, there might have been eight to ten women, no more, I don't believe. And they, the demographic was, was very different from the KKK who had been there um, in July. In July, the KKK came up this little chapter from North Carolina, and I know it's—I know you're not supposed to diminish uh, 
people or diminish their importance by how they look, but I'm going to try to be accurate. And they were hillbillies with wrong, uh, with typographical errors on their signs. And in addition to the racial slurs on their signs, they were, they were, again, I, I don't want to get into a big demographic kick, but they were not sophisticated people. Whereas the, the young men, mostly who congregated on the UVA lawn, they were young. They were college age for the, for the most part. And maybe some were in their mid 20s, upper 20s. I'm sure there were a few who were 40 or 50. But, but for, the, for the largest part, they were very young. They were very clean cut. And I don't know how to describe them other than that because. And I'm, as a journalist, I try not to treat people monolithically. I think different people might have brought different things to that event, but they were not engaged in a very thoughtful debate, I can tell you that. It's, you know, to, to comment on the appearance, I mean, truly, it, when you see a, a mob of people, but they're all wearing a polo shirt and khakis, you don't initially think that you're looking at anything other than a you know, spaghetti dinner for a lacrosse team, but it really is, it, it, was, it was scary, because when you hear that, you see them, and you, you hear maybe at first, you will not replace us, and you're first, who is this you that you're talking to? And then as you listen closer, you start to realize that it has grown, it has spread across this whole group, and you do have some people that maybe more closely resemble uh, what was present at the Klan rally in July, but you do have people that also, and we found out after, were professional individuals who dressed and acted as professionals and were employed with security clearances from the United States government, who really knew how to be sort of, you know, looking David Duke, they know how to be a suit and tie racist. Who is who is clean and acceptable, uh, but you know across that gamut, it did eventually turn into what I was able to hear both in recordings and coming through the windows of the church. Jews will not replace us. It was as if they were laying out their their thesis statement, you know, for the entire weekend. You know, whatever else happens here, whoever else we hate, no, Jews will not replace us. This is really where where we stand and where we can unite. Uh, you know, we hate a lot of different people together, but we can all hate the Jews as one. Uh, and that was really what I, what I pulled from that. So I'm going to pull folks into the conversation. Um, there are people who are going to be coming down and handing out cards or picking up, picking up cards, even better. Um, and then I'm going to bring, bring um, I'm going to start working through some of them. Let me, while we're waiting, can I ask you two a, a question? So, after Charlottesville, you reshaped your life in ways that you felt Charlottesville was so impactful that you needed to now take on new things. You wrote, you sat down and wrote a book, um, which is a profound thing to do. Can you talk about what was it about this Unite the Right rally that called on both of you to pay attention and to talk about it in a different way. What stayed with you that told you that you needed to tell the American public and that you needed to shift and shape how you did your organizing and community education? Okay, so I was approached by the University of Virginia Press and they said, you're, you're well known as a straight shooter, you have no axe to grind, we want you to do this book, you need to do this book, it's important history, and I was flattered, and I said, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> um, and, and so I did it, and it was under a tight schedule, because we had to get it out before the one year anniversary. Um, but, you know, there's some really painful things that, that are sort of surprising. Like, um, DeAndre Harris shouldn't have been beaten, right? No. Locked an old man with a mag light right in the face, which was the immediate precipitant for these guys tackling. Certainly doesn't make it right to beat him, but it adds a little context. So I saw through my own eyes, I didn't see that with my own eyes, 
but I saw through like eight or nine different videos, things like that, where there's a little bit more nuance. Here's another thing you probably don't want to hear. Trump was largely wrong, but Trump was also right. So when you talk about violence that day, the, by a mile, by 10 miles, the real violence was James Alex Fields Jr. running over 36 people with a car. That was the big violence. But Trump was not wrong when he pointed out that the Antifa were also spraying people right in the eyes with caustic agents and hitting them on the head with clubs. And that's why when I was at the KKK rally a month earlier, I, I, I hadn't coordinated with my two oldest kids, but I saw them there and I thought, okay, that's fine. They're curious, that's no big deal. But I was so glad that my kids were not at the um, United Right, because that was really scary. And I can't believe nobody got an eye poked out because it was just hand-to-hand -hand combat for an hour. And it was ugly, and urine, and water bottles, and smoke bombs, and just people just doing terrible behavior toward one another. So we sometimes we love to say Trump was terrible for saying both sides. That's probably right. But he did also point out that there was left-wing violence that troubled him. And sometimes we in the media don't like to admit that because it makes us feel bad, it kind of goes against the narrative. But I, I wonder to what degree Trump strengthened himself by pointing that out, and then people did watch the videos. I think he even said, you saw the videos with your own eyes. And I think that, I think that was a good point for him and his base. And, but it, it's also true. So I guess I'll continue from that, and then I'll shift back into your question. Uh, look, a lot of a lot of what I mean, pretty much everything you're saying is accurate. I, from my personal eyewitness, we were my sister and I camped out at this Methodist church. We went into the parking lot in the back, uh, sort of a to receive people that were coming from the synagogue after services got out, after they were allowed to leave, after you know having armed Nazis walking, marching in front. Uh, but you know, I look, I saw battles in the backs of pickup trucks. Like you, I, it's just something out of a pirate movie that you have you know, a white truck with a better flag on the side drive up and people start swinging sticks and you have Antifa people, anti-fascists, uh, you know, jump up and start battling at them too. You know, the police would walk by and say, why do you have those two by fours of the Antifa guys? And we're making signs. Uh, yeah. they, they weren't making signs. They weren't being violent with them. We have to acknowledge that. However, I, do not believe that a lot of that violence would have been perpetrated in the first place had the alt-right armed to the teeth not decided to come to town. Um, in terms of my own you know, experience and having that sort of make a, a perspective shift in, in my life, I think it was more of a, a reassurance. Uh, you know, I actually had recently, before that, I was studying to be a rabbi. I'm not anymore, all respect to the rabbis in the room. Um, but I, uh, I came back and I understood, okay, this is something I've been teaching teenagers, you know, to fight and stand up against Nazis and anti-Semitism and hate and intolerance, and so this is somewhere where I need to be. And then seeing not only the, the sheer violence, but hearing sort of every aspect of hatred being spewed in vitriol, uh, it really, and, and also seeing the, the after effects on my sister and the community, and understanding that August 12th didn't end on August 12th continued and it continues to this day. There is really no post Charlottesville. I sort of understood that this is a story that I have to share whenever I have the opportunity. Uh, I went after that I started working in Jewish advocacy with AJC uh, in Atlanta, uh, you know, working a lot with the Black Jewish Coalition there because I understood that this racism and anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and frankly xenophobia that is just so pervasive amongst those white nationalist alt-right groups and in the middle, and on the far left, it needs to be addressed. And it needs to be addressed by people who have seen it in its, in its most terrible forms. Uh, and, I, and I do believe that, at least you know, in the modern, you know, contemporary history of, of this nation and hate, 
That's what I saw. Is it really taking its most horrible form? It's helpful to think about um, when you think about uh, the political theater in some ways that was taking place um, on the streets. I'm curious, and I'm going to work in a question too that, that we got. Um, I'm curious a little bit from both of your perspectives. Um, so you have this kind of physical confrontation that's happening on kind of, you're having a real physical confrontation that is taking place. Where is the, where is the community? Where, where is the majority on that day? Right? What, what are they, and I'm gonna to you, um, I promise. <laughs> But in some ways, um, did the community's absence allow um, those on the left who wanted physical confrontation to fill a vacuum, um, fill a void? I'm, I'm curious. Um, I'm curious, were there, did the community engage? Uh, media didn't report on things that were happening outside the physical confrontation. And I, I asked this from a person in the audience who also asked a question. They're from Dayton, Ohio. And the KKK has been granted a permit to rally in downtown there on May 25th. And, and they want to know, based off your experiences in, in Charlottesville, what advice might you have for them? What might the leadership and the community of Charlottesville done differently. What did they do really well? So Charlottesville is now the textbook for what not to do. Um, the, the, the two warring sides cannot be trusted to come anywhere near each other. And Charlottesville actually should have known that because they were offered this information from other cities that had, had similar rallies in them. And they decided part of it was because they weren't they weren't there the sole force. The Charlottesville Police Force was in charge, but the Virginia State Police provided um, the bulk of the personnel by a factor of about four or five to one. And they didn't coordinate the two. The Virginia State Police and the Charlottesville Police were not talking, they, they literally were not even talking on the same radio frequencies. And the Virginia State Police at the last minute decided to hang back behind this barricade, which would have been the one sector of of police who could have interacted with the crowd and, and pushed people away from one another. And so other cities, have, the Charlottesville example is well known. There was a $300,000 report written up. Um, it actually consumed something like a million dollars in legal time, but it was sold to the city for $300. And it was actually really comprehensive, and it was held up as a model of transparency, and it revealed what went wrong. It's called the Hayfee Report, and other cities have it, and so they, they can use that to learn a better lesson. Can you give a couple of examples of what went wrong? Well, okay, so it, another part of your question was, what, what was the resistance like? And it was, it was multifaceted. Your sister was there with Cornell West, right, at the top of the stairs of the park, arms interlocked. No, sorry. That's a good question. So, uh, Cornell West was there with a bunch of clergy who walked over from First Baptist Church on West Main Street. They locked arms at the top of the park and they intended to keep the white nationalists out. And as, as they were standing there making a show of strength or a show of peaceful resistance, they looked down on Market Street and you can see another group of younger, um, not clergy um, citizens in Charlottesville. They were locked arms, and the, the, the white nationalists just like plowed through them like a freight train. And at that point, Cornell West and the clergy skedaddled because they thought they were going to get just killed, and, and they had a legitimate basis based on what they had just seen. So there was a lot of different kinds of resistance. There was, there was really, there was lovely resistance. There were signs with flowers on them and saying, love, not hate. And there, were, there was a lady I know ringing a cowbell. And there was, you know, all kinds of, like the clergy and, and rabbi, sister, and all these people trying to take the, the American spirit of peaceful resistance. But then there were other people who came to fight. So that was the next time.
that, yeah, there were a lot of people who were there to fight. They came to fight. You could see it on their faces and the gear that they decided to bring with them. They were ready for a fight. But there was also a lot of, as you're saying, beautiful resistance. And a lot of it was missed because A, that story doesn't sell, but B, it was inside. You know, a lot of it, truly, a lot of the best things that were happening in Charlottesville were happening behind closed doors, but they were closed for safety. They were open to the people uh, who needed those spaces. So we were at the, the Methodist Church, uh, and that was a safe space, a shelter. And so we were helping to, you know, sort of run this area that, you know, we had, it was almost, you know, as there was actually people with metal detector wands in the parking lot, you know, to let people in who either had been, you know, a part of the violence, you know, no questions asked, as long as you're not wearing the wrong colors, so to speak, uh, you know, you can come on in and we'll feed you and we'll give you water and you can rinse your eyes and you can, you know, there was a lot of a lot of pepper spray in it, so we, uh, but we, you know, we had spaces like that, and they, this was not the only church. There were various others, and there were businesses, local businesses, that opened their doors to shelter people. Uh, and so, you know, where was the community? The community was was trying. I think that the real core of the community, because most of the people that, that were fighting on either side were not from Charlottesville. Uh, you know, just in the same way that I'm not from Charlottesville. When I came. You know, I I didn't come to fight. Uh, I came to to help with those spaces. But that is true. That majority of the influence that turned things so sour was not local. And so the core of the community was really busy trying to hold itself together and try to be trying to be there for the people. And so some of the clergy took that action and linked arms and then, you know, thankfully protected themselves. Uh, some of them held up these safe spaces. My sister and I, we set up loudspeakers uh, and played guitar and sang uh, to the people in the park songs of love and Hebrew and English from various religious traditions. Uh, and, you know, hoping that maybe love would drown out the gate a little bit. Uh, and then we went to the back and played with, you know, a group of Quakers and did all these things. And, and to me, that is the success. Doing anything that is non-violent, that is physical and visible, that, that can, you know, sort of push against the hatred, that's important. There was a lot of that. There was a lot of that. But it, it, it unfortunately, the various factors did not shine through as the headline. So it's almost two years later. Um, what has changed in Charlottesville? If there hadn't been a death, would Charlottesville been new? Um, how do how is the community reflecting and rebuilding now? What are the challenges they still face? Well, I uh, was one of two reporters working for the New York Times that day, the lead reporter is a, is a staffer, she now covers Congress. And even though she got hit by a urine balloon, she turned to me after the rally was called off and said, well, that was a nothing burger. And I said, yeah, well, I guess I'll just go type up my notes. And she's like, yeah, I'll go type up my notes. We'll see you. Bye. And, 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 and I'm, I'm, I can't believe we said that, because in retrospect, we didn't get it. You know, like, we maybe were so focused on the fact that we thought everyone got out of there without an eye poked out or, or without serious injury. And we had no idea what was in store. So, it, my perceptions were completely wrong. Hers were completely wrong at, at noon, and then everything changed. Uh, but what's changed? Uh, the chief of police of the city is gone. The city manager is gone. The chief of police for UPA is gone. The chief of police for the state is gone. The, um, who did I leave out? The city attorney is gone. The city spokesperson is gone. Um, the mayor is gone. The city council will be almost all new faces. Um, it's, it's, and and um, we now have an African American female mayor, first one ever, um, which was. A, a great um, symbolic move, and she has pointed out some things that a lot of people. That, that was I think this is one of the biggest things I learned, which is how bad the legacy of slavery still hangs over the town. Because one of the things that doesn't get talked about enough is how white people have a lot more money. Just to be blunt about it. And, 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 
And it comes, in some measure, from the fact that in Charlottesville, the black people were the majority at the time of slavery. And so the white people were accumulating capital that they could pass on to their descendants. The black people were the capital. And even our big local king on the mountain, Thomas Jefferson, his racial legacy is so bad because, and it's not just presentism to say that, his neighbors were emancipating slaves and he wasn't doing it. He was buying all these bottles of wine and expanding his house and experimenting with different crops and all these really expensive things on the backs of hundreds of people. And there's this really, there's this little plaque. I live, like your sister, I live downtown. There's this plaque right outside my door. It says, on this site, um, slaves were bought and sold. And some person, I don't know who it is, but like every three weeks, this unknown, mysterious person takes the word, takes a little piece of cardboard and puts the word people over slaves, and it, remind, and it, and it just it makes the message so much more powerful. And, and that's the legacy of Charlottesville. Is a, a lot of the Chamber of Commerce will show you all these pictures of people on horseback and rowing crew on the river and stuff. And, but for the, for the descendants of slaves who still have the slave names, like, you know, like if you lived on the plantation, the, the guy, the, the family that owned the plantation, they had the name Jefferson, and then you had the name Jefferson if you were a slave. And there's Carr, and um, C-A-R-R, and um, uh, there's some other, they, they escape me now, but it's, it's a weird connection that these families have, but one side got all the wealth because they took it from the other side. The other thing that's changed is all the Confederate statues, which are still in the ground, are now covered with tarps. The tarps are gone, sorry, I was there in November, I'll be there next week. Yeah, before you, let me, and no, 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 I'm going to let you explain that, because I think folks are like, what are the tarps? So I think you should explain. Can I add a piece on to this um, as you explain? Um, who is there? Who took over in these marches? When you read the papers, sometimes you hear the word, it was an alt-right demonstration, sometimes you hear that it was a white nationalist demonstration. You know that the core organizers certainly were white nationalists and that was part of their goal, um, some described. Um, but who really made up the folks who were marching in Charlottesville that day? And give us some nuance. Maybe give us some nuance about who they were. So, ironically, the first person I photographed that day was James Alex Fields Jr., the convicted, now convicted murderer. He, I arrived at the park at about eight minutes after nine, and I took up some pictures, and he was in my pictures, and he was standing there alone. And who was he? I don't know. He didn't. He didn't. Uh, here's what we know about him. He was 19 years old. His family life was hell. His mental state was. He was on multiple medications and had been suffering from bipolar disorder and depression and a lot of and had a Hitler fascination that scared his history teacher badly. And the history teacher liked him to some degree, or at least respected that he was somewhat intelligent, and tried to, tried to get him out of this Hitler fascination, but it persisted, and so did his antisocial behavior. His mom called the cops on him, um, or called 911 on him several times, including one time when he held a knife near her, and she's confined to a wheelchair, and he's just a messed up kid. Like, I'm not trying to diminish or elevate him, I'm just telling you what I know about him, and and uh, here's, the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, this is really sort of interesting, because this also 
Again, I'm not trying to defend him, but I'm going to tell you something that will... I'm going to add some nuance. So, he drove from Ohio, Maumee, Ohio, right? Um, overnight. He drove through the night. He left, told his mom, take care of my cat, and going to Charlottesville, I want to hear this, a speech by one particular person. And, and sure enough, he gets there by himself. He doesn't have the shield then. He doesn't have any friends with him. He's all by himself. I see him, some other photographers see him. He's well photographed because he's like the first person there. So he gets hit with urine at some point. We don't know when, but at some point he gets some urine on him because the cops revealed that later on when they found it. He had the smell of urine. And he also, um, the, the, the thing was called off at like 11.30. Officer with Bullhorn, this event has been declared an unlawful assembly. Leave now or your owner is subject to arrest. And everybody leaves. And the last person left the park at 11.59 or, or right at noon. Well, that's when the speeches were supposed to be started. So I think he felt frustrated. He's been hit with urine. He gets in his car. He meets up with these people. He says, let's have lunch. And they testified at his trial. They'd never met him before, but they were going to like have lunch with him. And then this like other little interaction may or may not have occurred. This left-wing professor at UNC, um, who's part of a group called Redneck Revolt, which is like a left-wing militia, brags after the fact that he scared Fields out of the park with his um, by brandishing his his uh, semi-automatic weapon. And that's just like a block or two north of where he did his damage. He didn't put any of this defense on a trial, and I'm not saying it is a defense. But it, it raises, in my mind at least, the whole question of violently confronting one another. In my book, I also interview people who try to embrace one another. There's a guy named Christian Piccolini who used to be a skinhead, and he goes around the country embracing people because that's how they got him to stop being a skinhead. There's also, I didn't interview him, but I, there were some great interviews I drew from where there's a guy named um, Daryl Davis? No, Daryl somebody uh, from Baltimore. He's an African-American musician, and some people call him the Klan Whisperer. <laughs> some people question his methods, but he supposedly has gotten like X number of Klan people to give up their robes by loving them. I'll leave it there. And I'm going to take a last, um, I'm going to see if there are any more questions coming down real quick. We, we have probably time for two more, but um, I'll be able to get to maybe one of them, if there are any. Um, I'm going to come back to this um, to this question, um, it keeps coming up, so I, I want to keep coming back to it. You have now said a couple of times, I didn't know how serious it was. Um, you also said, I didn't realize. I want to hear a little bit about what is the win that you realize um, that this was important, right? Um, what happened, and what do you want the audience to know about why it's important? I think the, the realization of how big it was and how important and really monumental this event was kind of it came in stages. Uh, I think it started in the church with the, with the tiki torch going by, and it amplified with when I started smelling pepper spray for the first time. I now know what that smells like. If you don't know, it's not good. Uh, and it really burns your throat, uh, being on the steps of that church and then having to, to go back inside. Uh, probably by the third lockdown, I understood also. Uh, but I think it, it really actually hit me the next day. Uh, not on Sunday, but on Monday. Although Sunday was also uh, interesting on the downtown mall. There were a lot of anarchists that day, actually, uh, chanting for no government at all. Uh, which is a whole other 
thing. Um, but, but the day after that, I flew back to Cincinnati, uh, and I was sitting in the Charlottesville airport, and I was talking to a friend of mine, Rafi, very Jewish name, very Jewish guy, on the phone, uh, and I, I think, I don't know, I must have said something that, other than just the way that I look and carry my I must have said something that was like very Jewish, and it's likely that I did, uh, and suddenly I kind of like, I felt eyes on me, and I looked up, and I noticed that all in my gate, all people flying back through, uh, you know, uh, where was I? It was through Charlotte, uh, but also some of them joined me on my next plane to Cincinnati, uh, to CBG. There were people who looked a little sketchy, had a lot of tattoos. Some of them were like lightning bolts and things like that, which is an SS tattoo that I did see on someone's neck. Um, and, and lots of things, and, and I was a little uncomfortable. I know a lot of people with tattoos, many of my friends, it doesn't mean you're a bad person, but in the context of what I'd experienced, and the white t-shirts, and the you know, sort of over-exaggerated, I just worked out look, uh, made me feel like these guys might not have my best interest at heart. And, and one of them started talking to this family, un unsolicited, unprovoked, about how, you know, they said, oh, we come to Charlottesville all the time, we've never seen anything like this, and you know, we're, so upset. This is like our vacation spot. And imagine if you live here. Uh, but the this guy who's sitting across from us said, "Oh, I had a great time this weekend." And they were like, "What do you mean? Like it was so dangerous and all that?" He said, "Yeah, I don't know. I was out on Friday night. For those of you millennials in the room and then people who have kids who use the you know whatever, you'll know this term." He said, "It was pretty lit." That typically means it was a great time. But in that situation, he meant that he was carrying a torch. And I understood that in that moment. And I then noticed that he wasn't alone there. And there were others looking at him and you know, kind of giving approval. And there were, so probably in all, you know, five people out of this plane, I don't know, who were, you know, pretty clearly involved and made me instantly upon me sitting down. And I felt their eyes. I didn't want to use the restroom before I got on the plane because I was concerned about who might follow me in there. I was clearly speaking, you know, being a Jewish person and probably was doing a little bit of Hebrew chapels from time to time. Uh, and, and, and because for me, as an American Jew growing up born in the 90s, I've never had to face fear about what might happen if I wore Hebrew on my shirt or spoke in public. Uh, and yet, now I am in this airport terminal, coming fully to terms with, with my identity, uh, you know, and also coming fully to terms with the fact that this event didn't end on Saturday. It didn't end at noon. It didn't end at four o'clock. It didn't end on Sunday, and it still hasn't ended really, because this still exists in the world, and frankly, it's in our community. I don't think it's in this room, thankfully. <laughs> you know, it's outside of it for sure. You have to, you know. So that's, I guess, that's my moment. Uh, and what I want people to take away from that is, is, is that, that, is, that, that, that moment continues in this world. Uh, and I think that we are all feeling ourselves challenged uh, to, to figure out our identities and know where we stand right now. Uh, and, and it's important to see that, you know, we cannot be defined by those who hate us, but we also have to be vigilant. Oh, that is good. <laughs> Um, here's a question. How does the usage of the term fake news, um, used by the administration, incite the racism? Um, the person, um, in essence, are they denying the dangerous potential of this movement? Are folks denying what has happened? How has attacks on journalism and the media how impacted how the story is told? Uh, okay, well, I don't like when you said that, um, but I was hearing the New York Times podcast, The Daily, about three weeks ago, and the publisher confronted him on it and directly. He said, well, you know, maybe I'll less of that or something, or, or he gave some grudging acknowledgement that maybe he's gone a little too strong on that point. I'm, I'm, I feel like journalists, we're not supposed to be part of the story. It's, I, I, I teach a couple of classes at JMU occasionally at James Madison University, and um, I show my kids a clip of Nixon just blanket 
um, criticizing the press. So it's nothing new. It's, it's more extreme than it used to be. And I, like I said, I don't like it, but I, I don't know. Does it empower bad behavior? That's the question. Like, isn't that why we're here? Like, isn't the whole reason we're talking about white nationalists, some of whom are just really stupid people, and some who might have a bad idea, and some who could be changed? Aren't we all just sort of worried about the next Holocaust? And so, I don't, I don't know what to say. Like, is, is Donald Trump saying fake news going to hurt a journalist someday? I think uh, you know those of us who have studied and who will continue to study uh, sort of the, the, the steps to authoritarianism see that delegitimization of the press is sort of step one. I think you learned that downstairs in the museum, uh, and and so that to me is extremely concerning. But I think almost a greater concern about the news uh, as a, you know, a non-journalist and, and a big kind of, sort of a news junkie myself is that it really, I mean, it can make it hard to trust, but also that term has become a lampoon. Uh, so on the one hand, you can you know, post an article from CNN and have an alt-right troll say, this is fake news, and have the president say it's fake news. And on the other hand, you can have you know an article from The Onion, which is a great you know, satirical news source, and then you have people who are typically on the liberal spectrum joking around and be like, that's fake news, and it is fake news. But when we say it so much, and you know, we, we use it to describe real things as fake, it really, it's, it is the absolute encapsulization of postmodernism that we have to be afraid of, that there's no truth anymore. Uh, but, but looking you know, beyond that, it's just, what fake news describes every news for somebody. So where do we get to real news? You know, is there such a thing? Uh, and I think that's the fear, because if we can't trust the press, if we can't trust ourselves to identify real news, then you know, what types of messages are we going to internalize as true? So final question. Believe it or not, it's 355. Um, <coughs> What's one thing each of you wants the audience to know about the story of Charlottesville? And what do you want them to do with that information? I think I've already said the crazy controversial things that I'm going to say. So I hope I gave you some food for thought. And always question, even Donald Trump, like a clock, can be right twice a day. <laughs> The biggest thing to take away from the story is that, you know, as I think I should have become kind of a broken record, uh, it's, still, it's still part of our, our conscious, it's still happening. Uh, there's a, I, I wrote an op-ed, uh, I was fortunate to also be with JCRC and deliver uh, at, a, at the Cincinnati Regional Coalition against hey, I said there's no post Charlottesville. So that's kind of you know, the main thing, I guess, to take away, but also to go forward and, and know that, A, Charlottesville is a wonderful place to visit. <laughs> it isn't like that all the time, or almost ever. Uh, but but beyond that, it we have to know that it, it can it can happen anywhere. And when we're facing hatred, we need to stand up. We need to come together. But we we really have to, to try and keep the peace. Jeffrey and Haas, thank you for both for joining. My name is Walter Spiegel, and I am the president of the Jewish Community Relations Council of Cincinnati. Um, and uh, first of all, I want to just uh, thank you for that tremendously thought-provoking uh, panel discussion. So thank you again. I want to also thank all of our speakers today. We've had some really amazing, tremendous speakers, uh, very challenging, very thoughtful presentations. So for any of the speakers that are still in the room right now, I know some of them had to head to the airport already, thank you very much for the, your time and for your thought-provoking presentations. I would like to thank, on behalf of the Jewish Community Relations Council of Cincinnati, our partners, AJC Cincinnati, 
Jacob Rader Marcus Center, the American Jewish Archives, the Holocaust and Humanity Center, and Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. Uh, thank you so much for co-sponsoring this event with us. Thank you also to all of our allies, many of whom are here today. Um, I want to particularly thank, don't you walk out of this room right now, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank, in particular, our amazing staff from the Jewish Federation of Cincinnati. Um, Ellen, where's Ellen? Wave your hand. Ellen, uh, Justin Kirshner, and Jackie Congedo. anti-Semitism is frankly deeply, deeply personal. Um, 81 years ago, on November 9, 1938, a night which is now known as Kristallnacht, my then 15-year-old mother was at home in the third, her family's third floor apartment in Nuremberg, Germany, which by the way was where the original Sturmer was published. Um, for the rest of her life, the terrifying sound of Nazi jackboots stomping up the stairs of the apartment building was seared into her soul. Even more terrifying, though, was the memory of Nazi troops pounding on the door of the family apartment and demanding to see the Judenschwein Hans Wasserman, the Jew pig Hans Wasserman. But for me, growing up, it seemed to me that these stories were, as personal as they were, were really part of my family history and part of our collective Jewish history. But anti-Semitism, at least in this country, seemed to be a page from the past. And sadly, what we've learned today, what you've heard just now from this panel, is that anti-Semitism is not simply part of our history. It is, in fact, alive and well, and re-emerging and challenging, and tragically, in some cases, deadly ways. And as we all know, as was made clear today during today's discussions, the hatred that animates anti-Semitism is not limited to hatred to, towards the Jew. The hatred that my mother experienced in Nazi Germany, in Nuremberg, Germany, uh, is the same hatred that manifested itself in Pittsburgh. It's the same hatred that manifested itself in Charleston, South Carolina. And it's the same hatred that manifested itself in Christchurch, New Zealand. And for that reason, our discussions today were not limited solely to anti-Semitism. Our obligation is to speak out against hate and bigotry, no matter who the target. Jackie opened the day today by talking about how we can be a light amidst the darkness. There is tremendous light as I look around this room today. By coming here today and spending time in conversation with each other about how we can, better, how we can be better allies in the fight against hate, we are driving out that darkness. But today is not an end, it is instead a beginning. When you leave here today, what will you do with what you've learned here? By sharing our insights with others, we are driving out that darkness. We must continue these conversations with our families, our friends, and ultimately our broader communities. A few words about how you can carry forward today's learning. First. If you have not done so already, please join our Cincinnati Regional Coalition Against Hate in forming a united front against bigotry and hatred here in Cincinnati. On your phones right now, you can go to CincinnatiCoalition.org and pledge to stand against hate. 
This will also register you for updates from the coalition about upcoming future initiatives. Second, make sure before you leave that you have picked up your copy of Deborah Lipstadt's book. Uh, we have copies for everybody who was here today, so please make sure that you get, a cop get your copy. Uh, finally, uh, please join us on June, on June 18th at the Mayerson Jewish Community Center as our JCRC continues this conversation at our annual meeting where we will have Alana Newhouse, the founder and editor of Tablet Magazine, who will talk about her work as a journalist on the front lines of the evolving conversation on anti-Semitism. Finally, if you have not yet taken a tour of the Holocaust and Humanities Center uh, and you signed up for one, please meet at the top of the stairs, Sarah. Uh, bottom of the stairs. Bottom of the stairs, right thank you. Just out <laughs> at the conclusion of this event. If you have not seen the new Holocaust and Humanities Center, please make sure that you do so. Uh, a couple of quick logistics announcement. Uh, if you have a park, if you are parked, please make sure you get a parking validation pass. Use that when you exit. Justin is in the back waving his hand. I'll be out there. They're outside. He will be outside. Use that, not the ticket that you got when you came in, in order to get out of the parking lot. Uh, educators should pick up signed CEUs at the registration table. Um, we sincerely hope that today's conversations have been educational for you and have challenged you. And more so, we hope that today's conversations will inspire you. And we hope that they will inspire you to work together, fight against hatred and bigotry wherever it appears and whoever is the target. Please, um, thank you so much for joining us today.